Ooh. Hello, test, test, test. You can all hear me? Wonderful, I see some thumbs up. I'm Perry Adams. I'm special assistant to the director at DARPA and the creator of the AI Cyber Challenge. I'm uh, Andrew Carney. I am uh, program manager at DARPA and ARPA H uh, for the AI Cyber Challenge. So I see many, uh, many competitors in the audience today. So I think that many people here are very familiar with the AI Cyber Challenge. Uh, we announced at uh, Black Hat and DEF CON last year, and I think we upended some of your years. We were very excited for all the hard work that went into, went into the challenge, and we were very excited to bring it to DEF CON. So I want to first uh, start by thanking DEF CON for having us, thanking all of you for being such wonderful participants in the AI Cyber Challenge, either as competitors or as folks visiting the village, walking through it. We had, I think, uh, over 12,000 folks walk through the AI Cyber Challenge space, and we are so thrilled, so thrilled for that. <clears throat> So when we announced it last year, I think many people were asking, what is this? What would it become? I hope that we answered many of those questions in the village space if you weren't participating. I think many of you have spent the last year working very hard on developing, uh, developing systems that can find and fix vulnerabilities in software. And that really goes to the why of the challenge. Like, why, why did we do this? Why did DARPA think it was important not just to put on a challenge, but to come to DEF CON and to put on a show? Why did ARPA H think it was important to partner with DARPA for this effort? And that goes, it comes down to the fact that our critical infrastructure is very insecure. Software is what undergirds our world, and software has vulnerabilities. If you visited the village, if you've been to half of the talks at DEF CON, you're already sick of hearing about this, about this problem. I know Andrew and I talk about it all the time. All the time. Software is everywhere and there's vulnerabilities in it. And especially our healthcare infrastructure, our medical infrastructure, which is why it's so important that this is not just a DARPA effort, but an ARPA H effort. And we're incredibly excited to have them come on as partners. I've had many people ask me why, why X, why AI X CC, and this idea actually was suggested not by me, but by another program manager at DARPA who used to go by the handle SIGTRAP, and it's because X, hex CC, is a uh, SIGTRAP. It's a debug instruction in X86, and it's essentially an instruction that will stop program execution and say, hey, we're going to debug this. We're going to see what's wrong. And that's essentially what the challenge is about. It's about finding these vulnerabilities in software, finding these issues, and not just doing it at scale, not just doing it automatically, but then fixing those vulnerabilities automatically and developing systems that can be given to communities, that can be given to industry so that they can secure their own code. So AICC consists of two competitions. We announced last year, and we just wrapped up our semifinal competition. I know many of you are here, very excited to hear the results. And then, next year, we will be running our final competition. Seven of the teams that competed this year will be advancing to our final competition, and we will be back in August of 2025 to run that. We're very excited about that. Andrew, do you want to talk a little bit about ARPA-H and that collaboration? Absolutely. So when Perry, when uh, AICC began at DARPA, uh, Perry and I were already talking about the potential collaboration and transition opportunities into healthcare. Um, I actually had been at DARPA for many years and had gone to ARPA-H, a new federal agency focused on improving the healthcare of all Americans. Um, it's an incredible place to work. Uh, I was very excited to be there and sort of the magnitude of the problems, the uh, uh, complexity of the environment um, was pretty unreal. And so uh, when AICC sort of came into to being, the idea of very early on that we would have some kind of collaboration or transition kind of uh, working together was like always in the cards. Uh, and then, you know, the stars aligning so that we could work together in a very real way and sort of 
uh, make the challenge real together has been an incredible experience, uh, and I'm very excited uh, for the next year as well. And we've had fantastic partnership on the AI Cyber Challenge. So I started talking about, I started with thanking DEF CON for having us, and that has been a truly fundamental part of this challenge. Last summer, I called up Jeff and I said, listen, I want to do this thing, and he said, okay, let's do it. And that was pretty much the conversation. And he was an enthusiastic participant from the start. And that's pretty much been the case with all of our collaborators. When I approached them and said, here's what I'd like to do, all of them were on board because they understood the importance of securing the software. Many of these are technology companies. Actually, all of these are technology companies. So they themselves are software. So they understood the need to secure their own software. They understood the value that their tools, uh, their AI could bring to software security. And so we had Anthropic, Google, OpenAI, and Microsoft as our corporate partners, corporate collaborators on this effort. And they were, they have been fantastic bringing not just their models, uh, and making them available to the, uh, to the competitors, but also bringing their expertise, uh, expertise, both about AI and about software security. And then finally, we have the Linux Foundation, the Open Source Security Foundation. And these, Exactly. I see Omkar in the crowd right there. Uh, similarly, when I called up Omkar and I said, listen, I want to do this, he said, how soon can I get there? And I, I, they have been fantastic partners in this effort. Because the goal of the challenge is to focus on finding and fixing vulnerabilities in software, we needed software to focus on. And that's open source software. Open source software is the majority of software. Uh, it's what undergirds everything. The Linux kernel is everywhere. Nginx is everywhere. Open source software makes up a majority of our software. And so the challenges that we have, which Andrew's going to talk about in a little bit, are based on open source software. And that's in part because of all of the examples I just gave, but also because we wanted to make sure our challenges were modeled on real world examples. We wanted the tools that teams developed on this challenge to be able to apply to real world problems. And that brings me to the other open source aspect of the challenge, which is that all of the tools from prize winning teams will be open sourced. So the research that's been done on this challenge will be brought back to the community by open sourcing it. So yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's amazing, right? I'd like to take a moment before we get into the technical details of the challenge to just a huge shout out to the massive dedicated team uh, spanning technical disciplines, production, logistics, uh, every flavor of support uh, and uh, yeah, every role just filled across industry, academia, uh, our collaborators. Um, it, it has been a tremendous Making this happen in the time frame that uh, we were shooting for is immense. The challenges do not come together quickly, uh, and this one did, uh, and it came together successfully. And so that's something to be extremely proud of. And just, uh, I mean, a round of applause for all of our, our, like the folks that made all of this happen, the experience, the challenges, everything. Thank you. Uh, the joke I've been making all week is that it took a village to put on the AICC village. I don't know how funny that is, but I thought it was very funny. Oh. This is you, baby. I have the clicker now. Uh, uh, or almost, this is actually almost, me, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, so I talked a little bit about the kinds of challenges that we uh, focused on, and these were real open source projects that we chose. We were very lucky, again, to have folks like the Open Source Security Foundation come on board to make sure that we were doing this in a way that fit with open source community guidelines that gave back to the open source community, and we found their support to be incredibly impactful for this. We also needed to focus on real world vulnerabilities. We wanted to focus on vulnerabilities that are actually causing problems today. I don't know if any of you all have been tracking, but there was a recent rather large cybersecurity incident that took out a few systems across the world. Uh, 
and that was uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities. It was memory corruption vulnerabilities at a uh, high privilege level. And so we have the Linux kernel here. We have things running in Ring Zero for our uh, for our challenge. <clears throat> We have real world CVEs, CWEs, classes of vulnerabilities that we are using to model our vulnerabilities on top of. And finally, we have our, we have our sanitizer. So I talked about how we have these classes of vulnerabilities. The way that these challenges work is we take this open source software, we put our vulnerabilities in it, uh, for compares to find. But the question maybe you're asking is, well, this is open source software. It might have vulnerabilities. This is real world software. And as we just talked about, there's vulnerabilities everywhere. And so we couldn't just have this nice little answer key for us to find uh, uh, and fix vulnerabilities on. We couldn't just judge teams based on that. So we had to find a way to check if a vulnerability was actually a vulnerability that a team found and if they fixed those correctly. And what we did was we used sanitizers uh, for this. Uh, these are sanitizers like address sanitizer, KSAN, Jazzer, etc. that are themselves open source projects that are maintained by some of our collaborators, by some other folks that are used in program analysis tools today. And one of the reasons for this is to design a competition, which does have to be gamified in some ways, but to design it using tools that are already present in software development life cycles. Again, to make sure the things that came out of this challenge can be given back to the community. So the first challenge project that was announced was the Linux kernel. Not a single kernel module, not a driver, the Linux kernel. Uh, both the scale, the complexity, the size, and also the ubiquity of it in real life. This was an incredible challenge project to start with. Um, and the amount of the Linux kernel that was harnessed in this case was pretty significant. Um, we saw, uh, you know, approaching 20% kind of of the, the, the code in scope was uh, available for potential CPVs. Um, and also the way the code, the CPVs or the the challenge projects and challenge project vulnerabilities, forgive my uh, lack of acronym kind of clarification up here. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, if anyone's ever, uh, raise your hand if you've ever written a fuzzer or a harness, right. It's super easy, right? It doesn't take any time at all. It's not a huge time sink for you actually finding vulns. No, it's incredibly Andrew challenging. Andrew's being sarcastic there. Slash S, right? Like it's very, very challenging. Um, and I just like to say, just generally to a huge shout out to um, Jonathan Metzman, the Google Project Zero team for working directly with us on infrastructure and sort of tackling some of the like fully automated, uh, both evaluation and the infrastructure challenges with, with running this competition at this scale in this way. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you to OSS Fuzz, Google for that. Yeah, we were very lucky that OSS Fuzz had already gone through some of the pain and suffering of doing vulnerability discovery on open source software at scale. Yes. And they brought a lot of those lessons learned, and they were very helpful. Absolutely. So uh, the second challenge project that we'll talk about is Nginx. Uh, this is uh, one of the most popular web servers running 20% of the world's busiest websites. Uh, a good chunk of its code base is open source. Um, the statefulness of this code is significant. It's a lot of S's. Um, uh, but this was another of our uh, uh, challenge projects, and once again, harnessing uh, a significant portion of the code base, but not, not the entirety. SQLite was the third of the five. Um, SQLite has an extraordinary uh, uh, community producing unit tests and tests for it. Um, this makes patching it challenging, because you have to pass a lot of those tests, um, and it's also been looked at a lot. It's also an OS. I mean, it's an OSS fuzz project, uh, and so we took that into the competition, knowing that if we could find things that were different than what was being found in the within the community at large, that would be extra exciting. Jenkins. So something that we haven't maybe touched on, or it, the fact that Java was in scope was a big deal here. Um, Java is everywhere. Uh, one of the major projects that we've been talking about um, is actually the, the payment system that's used for Medicare. So in health and human services, uh, about 5% of our GDP and the healthcare of 50 to 70 million Americans, depending on how you slice it, goes through a code base that is uh, COBOL and Java, ancient COBOL and new Java. Um, surely nothing will go wrong. Uh, but 
you know, reasoning over this code base, especially in, while it's transitioning, this is a huge undertaking. And so it's one of the many challenges that when we're talking about critical infrastructure um, across sectors and places where the DEF CON community can potentially help, can plug in, can really um, make a big difference, both personally and just for society at large, that's one of them. And so we're hoping to, to sort of point out more of those. Um, very little of that has to do with Jenkins, that's all Java. Uh, but Java is incredibly important because uh, the first two challenges we talked about are uh, compiled languages C and C++. They focus on uh, 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 they focus on memory corruption vulnerabilities, largely the C challenges, and then uh, Java focuses on a different class of vulnerability. Uh, I know that lately, especially over the last couple of years, memory corruption, memory safety has been a major topic of conversation, and we want to make sure that was front and center of this challenge. But of course, it's not the only class of vulnerabilities that we need to worry about. As Andrew says, these kinds of vulnerabilities, these kinds of software languages are present in our healthcare industry. They're present across the board. And so Java and the kinds of vulnerabilities that aren't necessarily memory corruption that you find in there, we also had in scope, which is very difficult uh, to develop sanitizers that can find uh, and identify whether or not teams have accurately identified a vulnerability. And just to even hit that a little more, right? Sanitizers, the ability to automatically have a relative, to have a high confidence sort of indicator or oracle that you found something worth addressing, right? That's huge. Like knowing that there's something there that you should investigate further or allocate resources towards is tremendous. But that instrumentation on its own um, needs TLC. Like it needs support. It's hard to do. Uh, so, uh, once again, if you're looking for an additional hobby, maybe uh, uh, working on Jenkins or on uh, uh, Jazzer or, or sanitizers for Java generally is something uh, to consider. Um, I'll also say that for Jenkins was especially interesting. You'll see that the CPV entry points, kind of the reachable uh, functions and nodes, feels relatively low. Uh, it has to do with the plugin architecture of Jenkins, and so the fact that you know the base sort of avail uh, reachability seems low, but as you start loading plugins and at runtime, things get far more complex very quickly. And, and when Andrew says reachability, what he's getting at is, well, maybe there might be a flaw in the code, but can you actually reach that flaw? Can an attacker actually start from an entry point into that code and get to that, what we call a sync, get to that uh, uh, get to that flaw. And so that's one thing that uh, you're checking when assessing if a team has actually found a uh, found a vulnerability is reachability. And so that's some of what went into the design of these challenges. Uh, and then w again, when Andrew talks about uh, the sanitizers and puts out a call for uh, help with Jazzer, it's it's because it can be very difficult to say, okay, I've uh, injected code in a command line or something something like that. But was that actually attacker controlled malicious code? What kind of constraints were on? Is it actually a vulnerability? This challenge runs into fundamentally hard problems in program analysis, such as vulnerability metrology. How do we assess if a vulnerability is real or not, and how do we assess its severity? And that was an interesting part about running this challenge, was for the technical team putting together these challenges, how do you address this in a creative way, in a how do you create a gamified environment that's not too gamified? So these are real world tools, but also allows the teams to compete against each other in the time frame. And I think if you visited the village, if you went through Northbridge City, you were able to talk to some of our challenge developers and hear about the thought and the uh, serious uh, effort that went into creating this competition. I also say that we have, uh, we've been interviewing our challenge developers and uh, once after we announced the, the results from uh, this first year, uh, we're hoping to put a lot more information just to share, because this process is fascinating. Uh, the idea of creating a gamified challenge, as Perry's saying, uh, but that is at the scale and scope and complexity of real software, uh, I mean, it's very challenging. Um, uh, it's perhaps mo more uh, type two fun than type one fun uh, relative to like CTF work. So it's, it's not fun when you do it, it's fun afterwards. Um, so uh, the last challenge project is Apache Tika. Um, and a huge thanks to Tim Allison, uh, one of the primary maintainers and uh, someone who has written challenges for this, who's shared war stories and perspective. Um, and uh, this is just, it's been incredible to have someone who's so tightly integrated into this code base working with us. Um, Apache Tika, uh, actually, it, it, it's parsers. It's thousands and thousands of parsers, which are some of the safest code on the planet, right? Like parsers, they're, yeah, parsers are... Andrew's being sarcastic again. 
once again, I should be more sarcastic and maybe careful with that. Um, but it's, it's all parsers, and it's parsers that are used all over the place, places you would not expect. Um, so this is kind of thinking about that invisible software infrastructure that we rely on, that we may not know we depend on, um, the services that may be backed by Apache Tika that you're using as an API happily. Uh, you may really want that Java to be more secure uh, without realizing it. Another big piece of this challenge, and uh, something that affected the teams, uh, affected the challenge development and organization, was leveraging external resources. The collaborators provided us access to their uh, LLMs, to these services that were changing. Um, very grateful for their involvement, and, but we never expected any of them to change their release cycles based on our needs. So we had to meet them kind of based on where they were and where they were going. These models were changing every few months, every few, well, fast. They were changing fast. And so over the year of the challenge, I mean, the models that were available when the challenge was announced are not currently available, or at least these are not the ones that we're focused on. Um, and that's a big difference from a lot of DARPA or just ARPA flavored challenges generally. Uh, when you're trying to frame the problem, when you're trying to create sort of momentum in a direction and bring communities together to solve something, Part of the design, a big component, is how, how do I define the problem in a way that won't change while the competition is running or that will change in a way that is um, manageable? These changes were manageable. They were very challenging. Uh, and so a huge just thanks once again to the organizers and the competitors who hit this timeline, who were able to, to move at the speed of industry leaders. Like That's incredible. Yeah, so uh, uh, we've talked a lot up until this point about the cyber part of the AI cyber challenge, and this is really one of the AI parts of the AI cyber challenge. Uh, one thing that I was asked uh, a number of times is, do I have to use AI? Can I just create a system? Is there a requirement? And, and no, we don't believe in mandating approaches. The thesis, though, of the challenge is that AI could make a fundamental dis uh, difference. It could be a revolutionary add-on to uh, existing program analysis methods for finding and fixing vulnerabilities. And so one, of, uh, one way in which our collaborators uh, participated was to provide access to their cutting edge uh, large language models and other large models for this, uh, for this challenge. And part of the reason why Andrew and I are getting into the weeds a little bit uh, is because running a challenge like this is hard and required quite a lot of coordination with the partners, and we're just incredibly happy that we uh, we had that. Absolutely. Um, also, uh, using so we were not prescriptive within this list. The competitors could use whichever models they chose. Um, uh, with constraints that we'll discuss a little bit later, but it was their choice. We were not forcing them to use a specific model within this set. Um, and we, we had a, a shout out to Light LLM, which is the proxy that we used uh, as a, a means of providing them access in a way that we could regulate. Speaking of resources, so in addition to the LLM access, um, these fully autonomous systems that you know were not touched by the competitor teams while they were running, uh, this was the amount of compute that they were given. Uh, it's significant. It's not insignificant, um, but it's still you know when we're talking about relative cost, right? We're talking about tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars per week, um, or tens to hundreds of dollars per per week uh, or month, depending on your usage. Um, uh, and the other big constraint was how do we limit the use of the LLMs? So we actually used their pricing, we pinned their pricing, and each challenge project, each team was given a budget of $100 across those models to allocate as they saw fit, um, and then four hours of wall, wall clock time uh, with this compute and access to those LLM APIs. Uh, and that's sort of what they were working with. That was the you know those were their tools, that's the or the the resources they had in addition for their CRSs to leverage. And this goes back to the fundamental uh, idea of the challenge. We want to create uh, software security systems that are usable by the community. So not only open sourcing them, but making sure that the resources needed to run them are reasonable. Absolutely. The competitors. So we had an incredible response um, uh, 
to the competition kind of call for call to action. Uh, and we ended up getting 91 teams sign up, verified, kind of go through all of the initial registration and like kind of validate that they're, they're interested in competing. Uh, as we released the challenge exemplars, things for them to practice on is sort of like, what will the competition look like? How do I know what scoring, what, like what, how do I know if I'm winning? How do I know what will, will win? Um, as they got more and more details on that uh, between April of this year and July of this year, which once again, like that is a very, very tight timeline to operate on, a uh, very tight window, um, we, we narrowed the field to 39 teams that kind of made it to the starting line. Those teams had something that could be proficient, could, could be performant in this competition. And that was very exciting. And just once again, I, I have immense respect for all the teams, even whether or not they made it to that starting line. Just this was an extremely challenging challenge. The software development challenge, I'm saying challenge a lot. Um, the difficulties of creating fully autonomous closed loop systems uh, that you expect to run with a lot of resources, um, it's not easy. Uh, it, and so, uh, you know, being good at VR, like being good at vulnerability research, like being excellent and other kind of programming disciplines does not necessarily equip you to produce software that can uh, survive uh, in this challenge environment. And so um, we worked with the teams, uh, but we, we really just saw it was exciting to see the growth, like folks really mature kind of their capabilities from a um, kind of development and uh, stability and performance side uh, on top of the amazing program analysis and kind of AI based tools that they were developing. I guess I could see that up a bit more. Yeah, so uh, uh, just to be clear, Andrew and I are doing this to torture you if you are a team in the audience. I think it's been about 20 minutes. Yeah, we're watching that timer real close. Since we started. Um, I'm not going to say whether we're close or not. Uh, you'll just have to sit there. Um, uh, but uh, our overall results, Andrew, do you want to so, talk about the slide? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the scoreboard that you saw in the city. Um, each of those hexes actually represents one of the CPVs that we inserted into the challenge projects. Um, and this was sort of the performance across all of the competitors uh, over the course of the competition. Um, we, we saw a really strong performance in Nginx. Uh, we saw a really, like, that lone uh, discovery in the Linux kernel, but that is a discovery that that is an achievement, um, and then we saw uh, kind of performance across that range with the other challenge projects. Um, it was really interesting to see uh, the fact that the patching was was successful. That we saw successful patches across a range of CWEs, a range of challenge projects, and a range of languages. Getting in a little bit to more detail. Um, so this is probably one of those slides that's way better to either screenshot or like watch the video later and read about. Um, Are but, you saying there's going to be additional material later that talks about this? I mean, details. We love details, right? Uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to releasing more competition kind of details to the, the community kind of at large um, uh, soon. Uh, but this is the high, kind of the high level cut here. Um, and, you know, the takeaways are some of what we expected, right? We expected people to do well with uh, whether it was a write or a read, but some flavor of heap or buffer overflow, so or stack-based buffer overflow. Um, we saw strong patching, strong discovery there. Um, we saw, uh, uh, you know, the Java results, uh, I think perhaps the Java software security ecosystem could use a bit more love. Like we would love to see that, uh, that space get more love. But we saw a promise there too. Um, so the fact that we did see successful discoveries and finds across uh, uh, command injection um, uh, and SSRF, uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, and that's important. We're finding both memory corruption vulnerabilities and non-memory corruption vulnerabilities, yes. like command injection. So we have some we have some fantastic coverage there. If you were paying very close attention to the numbers there, um, they did not necessarily match the scoreboard because we actually had a team find something that we did not insert. Um, we found, or one of the teams found something, found a bug in SQLite. Um, if you recall from earlier, SQLite has an extremely active user base. It's an OSS fuzz project. Um, it has an extremely comprehensive corpus of unit tests. Um, and we found a uh, null DRF, or one of the teams found a null DRF uh, uh, in SQLite. And it uh, has been patched. Uh, so that, I mean, that is very exciting. Like, real real code was was both analyzed, a def defect was discovered, 
and a patch or, or and a defect was discovered. Uh, we, we can't take for the patch credit for the patch in this case, but like year two, hashtag year two. Um, but that was very exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Woo, seek the light. Uh, uh, also, credit where credit is due, um, that was Team Atlanta. So give it up for Team Atlanta. Yeah. Good job, guys. Okay. Uh, I, ooh, I think we're getting a little, a little closer. Uh, so these were all of the semifinal competitors. Do you want to say anything? Good job. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you all so much for participating. Thank you all so much for uh, your hard work, for developing these systems, for working with us as you submitted it. I'll say also, uh, you know, there is so much opportunity for this type of work. I mean, no one here lacks for opportunities for work, but if you've done this, regardless of where you land, regardless of if you move on to finals or not, like what you developed, what you produced has value. And I strongly encourage you to think about ways of keeping that momentum going, uh, perhaps not at the breakneck pace of the challenge, you know, live your lives. Um, but there are lots of places that could benefit from this work and lots of ways for you to turn this into something very real. Um, if you're not going to use it any further, if, if you're like, nope, I'm out, open source your CRS, please. Like, give that back to, like, please. Um, uh, I will bake you cookies. Um, Andrew's cookies are very good, I can uh, attest. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and, and just to echo Andrew, thank you so much for all of the work that, that you did. Every single team that participated provided value. You gave back to your community. You invested in the software security of our nation, of our world. Uh, and that has been really impactful. We are so grateful to have so many fantastic competitors. And we are so grateful for you working with us over the last year. Uh, uh, for your understanding that a challenge like this has, uh, is, uh, is a hard thing to do. It's hard to drive innovation in software security. And we were fantastic, we were thrilled to have such fantastic, intelligent, uh, uh, competitors who, to Andrew's point, uh, uh, do not lack for job opportunities. Let me, one more time, guys, the competitors. Thank you. You ready? Okay. Okay. So uh, 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 there is actually a uh, point to uh, that we are building towards, and that is to announce uh, announce the results of the challenge. Are you all ready? I, I don't know. It didn't sound like you all were ready. Can we do that again? Uh, okay. What you just did, I'm going to need you to do that after every... Uh, every competitor that we announce, and we are about to go into the seven, the seven finalists of AICC. Each team will win two million dollars. And so here we go. These are in alphabetical order. So, uh, okay, it's the next. Uh, the safety slide. The safety slide, right? Forty-two beyond bug. Uh, one of them tweeted, I think, yesterday that uh, just seeing the first bloods they were getting on the scoreboard made all the sleepless nights worth it. And so I hope this does as well. Yeah, uh, really appreciate their uh, balanced approach, both over C and job, the Java challenges. Like, great job. All you need is fuzzing brain. So this is my favorite kind of like characterization. Um, all you need is fuzzing brain had the most aggressive use of the LLMs. <laughs> 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 Apparently, you need more. Yeah, what, what Andrew means is for, for uh, a challenge where many competitors used a lot of fuzzing, they used a lot of LLM. But
Very nice. Team Lacrosse, you had the most memorable patch when we were doing validation. So thank you for that. Shellfish. I, I take it there are some shellfish folks in the crowd. Just, just a few. Yeah. A few. I, yeah. Uh, your uh, your um, software engineering approach was ambitious, I'll say. <laughs> Team Atlanta. Yeah, fabulous job with the the SQLite find. Very cool. Awesome, awesome work. Theory. At some point, I'd like it confirmed to me if theory is actually two guys, because that's the rumor. But, but congratulations, theory. Do you, do you have a theory about that? Uh, I, I think I may have just uh, shared it with the crowd. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, we're here all day. <laughs> Trail of bits. Uh, your your judicious use of the LLMs was also appreciated. I also appreciate uh, the information that you all have put out about your uh, about your thoughts on the challenge, as well as uh, your thoughts behind your system for a competition where many folks, understandably, are keeping it a little close to the vest before finals. The fact that you're sharing with the community some of the lessons learned has really been fantastic, and I've heard that feedback. The the backup scoreboard on Twitter wasn't bad either. Yes. Thank you, Dan. And Thanks. ladies and gentlemen, the finalists. Each of these teams is winning $2 million and a chance to come back to DEF CON in 2025 to compete in AICC finals. So to all the competitors, we will be reaching out shortly to provide detailed scoring information. We have a lot more information to share about the competition now that the results are out. Um, and just really looking forward to, to engaging more uh, over the next year and uh, seeing what we can all do working together. Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you so much.